Yep. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is our simulation experience in low vision. And I'm going to be working between two laptops. So forgive me if I'm a little clunky here. Um, so I'm going to start with the categories of vision loss. And most visual impairments fall within these uh, categories. We have decreased visual acuity. I'm going to talk about each one a little bit more as we go. A central visual field loss, a peripheral field loss, and a cortical visual impairment. And you can always you can also have a combination of any of these together. And the first one we'll look at is decreased visual acuity. And um, for an example of this, the somebody with albinism would have decreased visual acuity. They have difficulty uh, recognizing faces. They have just an overall um, kind of uh, difficulty seeing detail. So um, it makes it difficult to judge distance and um, glare from lighting, uh, windows can be a problem and their eyes get very tired, um, especially towards the end of the day. So if you are asking a child to do something very visually demanding, you probably want to want to do it earlier in the day. Um, and it can also be affected by health. So if they're not feeling well, things like that will matter. And what I'm doing today is we're just going to go through a few basic slides so you have an idea of what you're going to be working with. What we're going to do is you're going to put on goggles after this explanation of some of the, the basic um, types of vision loss and some of the devices I have out there. And then um, you're going to go through five stations. And I'll talk about each of the stations after we're done with the slides. But you'll get to experience um, some different uh, types of visual, visual impairments and what the effect they have on um, is on um, their daily activities. Another type of visual impairment is the central visual field loss. Um, this is common for um, people who have star guards, um, a lot of macular degenerations. Um, they have trouble recognizing faces, seeing fine detail, because if you think about having no vision in your central, um, where you're looking all the time, um, you're going to have difficulty with things like reading, um, um, a lot of different tasks. Um, sometimes there can be loss of color discrimination. They can have difficulty maintaining eye contact because they're not seeing your face. Um, and again, visual fatigue is really common. Um, one of the things that students can be taught to do, and a lot of kids do this naturally, is um, to uh, use their eccentric bit. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's when you're looking at something and if you look just slightly off to the side, you're really using your per peripheral vision to look at something. So you're moving that blind spot out of the way to see something. So if you see students um, or, or your child just looking at something, but then looking slightly off to the side, they're looking around the, uh, their blind spot so they can see it more clearly. The next one is a peripheral field loss, and you're going to have difficulty with spatial awareness. We also call it tunnel vision, and you can see why, because um, it looks like you're looking through a tube or a tunnel. Um, decreased visual acuity comes with that often, um, and the need for more light. And you'll see at a couple of the tables, I have some lamps out there, and those lamps can be, you know, having that increase in light can really make it easier for somebody to see something. And I know that as we get older, we all need, like I, I tend to walk towards light to see something now, um, but that's that's because it makes it easier. It adds more light onto the retina. It makes it easier and clearer to see. Um, obviously you're gonna have difficulty reading because you're seeing this much of the page. Uh, we all jump ahead when we're reading. 
and we use our peripheral vision, but if you don't have that to use, you're looking at a single spot that's going to take you longer to read and be more tiring. Uh, let's see, visual, uh, poor light dark adaptation. So there's going to be a more common problem when you're coming in from outside and your eyes adjusting as you're going from uh, really bright outdoors to coming into a building or for, um, you know, vice versa, for leaving a dark space and going out into the light. It can be um, more difficult. Uh, students, we have a lot of students um, who have retinitis pigmentosa and they have tunnel vision. Eventually, it takes a, lot, a bit of time, but eventually they lose the peripheral vision. And the, the last one we're going to talk about, and these are kind of the basic ones, is a cortical visual impairment. And the type of, the way this affects the, the, their vision is really dependent upon where the brain is, is affected. Um, so the location of the damage, uh, visual perceptual difficulties, um, and the inability to coordinate visual information with their other senses. So you'll often see a student with CVI will be distracted by sounds. They'll stop looking at something. They'll start listening. It's much easier to listen than it is to see for these kids. Um, and uh, they will often be attracted to certain colors. Um, so it's really helpful in low vision if you're using those colors or if you're um, using them as contrast, which is also really important in keeping things from being too cluttered. And that's generally the case with all of these uh, types of visual impairments is the less clutter, the better. You know, don't have things too close together, um, too many things on a page. Uh, you'll see in some of these situations that I've set up for your simulation, you'll see that there is uh, there are examples of doing things such as following a recipe for a trail mix that you're going to make, um, that some of the recipes are in front and some are in dark, bold, um, pen and they're um, spaced out. So the reason for that is just to, to see with your goggles how difficult it can how difficult it can be if you have you know if you're using pencil and how much easier you know, a time a child will have if you're using a gold marker on white paper. You know. So move along. So I'm going to talk a little bit about optical devices. These are some of the devices that we use um, with students to just maximize their vision. Uh, there are stand, these are for close work. So doing things like reading or, um, you know, looking at a comic book, whatever kids are looking at these days. Um, and stand magnifiers are really nice because they sit directly on the page. You'll see those back at a couple of the stations back there. They sit directly on the page. They're easiest for kids to use because they are, uh, there's no focal distance to worry about. They're set in that magnifier. So the, the child sets it on the page, it magnifies the print or whatever they're looking at, the picture, and it's all set up for them. So generally for younger kids, that's what I recommend. Uh, you'll see several different examples back there. There are some that have light in them and some that, um, have no light. So take a look at those, see the difference. Um, does having the light in your stand magnifier make it easier to, to read or not? Some kids have light sensitivity and having a, uh, a magnifier with light in it or having um, a, a table, a lamp, like task lighting might be too much glare. So it really is so individual that um, it's worth just trying everything out with the child and seeing which works for them. Uh, Handheld magnifiers, we're all familiar with those as the inspector type magnifiers. Uh, those are the most difficult to use. Uh, you're not going to use that for any long-term reading. It, if a student uses it, it's usually just for uh, spot reading. Um, I have some teeny, so it's smaller like pocket magnifiers that are like that back there that you can take a look at. Um, they can just be stuck in the pocket and you know a child can pull it out and just look at something like a tag, a price tag on something. You know, you can say, how much is that? And they can pull it out and look. Um, or if they wanna see fine detail on something, 
but otherwise it wouldn't be used. This type of magnifier is really not for you know, any long-term reading. Next category of devices are distance devices. And um, they're best for things like sitting back from the TV and watching TV. Um, they're good for um, going to a movie, attending a sporting event. There are certain glasses that you can use that are magnifying um, at a distance. Uh, handheld monocular telescopes can be helpful for spotting things out in um, the community. They can be helpful for looking for a uh, street address or a street sign. Um, or trying to find your friend on the playground, maybe. Um, you never want to be using one and walking at the same time because, you know, they could get hurt. But um, you stand still, you locate what you're trying to find, and then you, you go towards that object. Um, and then the, what I was talking about, these Max TV glasses are, um, are good for uh, shorter distance. So if you're sitting in the living room and your child is getting really close to the TV, just to get them back on the couch, sitting in the back from the TV and watching. But they wouldn't be good for uh, you know a large playground. So I would say probably within, I think they're good for within six to 10 feet. Um, and we don't wanna forget non-optical devices. There are a lot of things that can be done that are, that don't require any kind of a device really. Uh, one of the things that makes things bigger is to bring it closer. We call that relative distance magnification. So you see your child maybe holding something really close. What they're doing is increasing the size of the object on the retina. And that's what that does. Um, if you notice that as you get older, um, you tend to hold things further away. Um, that's the, the opposite. Like we, we lose our ability of our... Um, uh, our eye to be able to accommodate. And so we will hold things out to get a clearer picture of it. But for little kids, they have a natural ability to magnify and they already know I'm gonna bring this closer and I'm gonna see it better. Um, and large print is a really common way to just use um, uh, uh, the uh, non-optical device and what we call regular print is usually about 12 point font. In large print, oops, which is not considered large print, um, is 14 to 16 point font, and 18 or larger is considered large print. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages to using large print. Um, it's not readily available. That's one of the disadvantages. You'll also see on one of the back tables there, I brought in a large print textbook. Uh, and take a look at it and see how manageable you think it is because it's about this big and it is heavy and the children usually have to like lay across it to see the top of it. It's just not very practical. So um, a lot of the kids that we work with also don't want to look different. And that's, you know, one of the ways they can look extremely different is by carrying around this big book with them. Um, so magnification of any kind is preferred over using large print, but sometimes in a pinch or um, sometimes if that's what the student will get the students working with something or um, doing an activity, it can be handy. Oh, I already went through advantages and disadvantages, but um, see if I missed anything. Um, you can use, one of the advantages is you can use a uh, magnifier with large print. Um, generally, if you need to do that, you're probably better off going to a different device. So I would say move to probably a video magnifier at that point. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with those, but um, it is an electronic way to increase uh, the size of something. Um, and those are, I don't know if any of you are going to a big system technology session with Amy Snow, but she has some of those that she's going to show. Um, cool. The other important thing is contrast. It's probably one of, with lighting, probably one of the most important things. Um, and you'll see at the first two stations that I created things using 
varying levels of contracts. So the, the object of that is just so that you can see that um, just simple things like having something black um, underneath what the child is working on, if it's a white piece of paper, just adding that contrast helps with boundaries. Um, it, it causes less glare from overhead lighting. So there are a lot of advantages to having contrast. And as you can see from these, uh, these two examples, you know, obviously putting rice or whatever that is into a white bowl makes it really hard to see that. And you can see the contrast with the coffee and the white. So the pouring station, you'll have some examples of that as well as um, the trailing station. Uh, glare is really important part of lighting as well. And um, glare comes in two forms. There's discomfort glare. And you can tolerate that if you can kind of like, oh, it's kind of bright, you look away. Um, disability glare, it really interferes with functioning. And that's the type that you would have if you were, you know, when you're driving and it's, you know, dusk, but the sun's starting to go down and you're just like, oh, I'm barely, really blinded by how bright it is. Um, in schools, kids can get that from um, anything at home, from windows. So if they, they might need the curtains drawn, um, they can get it from overhead lighting or sometimes um, LED lights can be overly bright for kids. So make sure you experiment with different lighting at home too. One of the things uh, at the low vision clinics that I usually recommend is just using a soft white bulb. Um, LEDs are great for uh, being able to uh, read something. So like magnifiers have LED. Some, some table lamps have task lighting have LED lights. And those are great for directing onto something. But when you have them in overhead lighting, it can be um, really hard on the eyes. It has a, a, a lot of uh, red, um, I'm sorry, blue light waves. You want, you want uh, red. The blue is, you know how we have blue blockers, blue blocking glasses on our, um, that we can use to reduce screen. Um, blue light, uh, the blue light can be really, really hard on the eyes. So, and those, there's a lot of blue light in a lot of the lights that we use. So use soft white whenever possible. Perfect. Yeah, sorry, are you referring to the, the color temperature of the bulb? Then? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Rather than just being LED, whether it's blue or... Right, or right, the color temperature, yeah. Exactly. Um... Oh, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, we already talked about lighting. So I know we want to get to our stuff. Um, so some other non-ocular devices, and you'll get to experiment some of these, are like a bold tip pen, black um, pen, um, bold line paper. There's some of that the, uh, station back there. Uh, reading stands, and you'll see uh, there's also a... a a template back there. It's we call it a typoscope, and it has black and it has a line cut out of it, and it just reduces all the clutter around. And a student can write just within the cutout portion of that. There's one that you can take a look at back there. Okay, so we're going to do our simulation now. The things I want everybody to remember is that the goggles are not going to be exactly what a visual impairment is like. I mean, they're to get a rough idea. And so don't assume that if I'm looking through um, this certain acuity, that that's exactly what my child sees. There's so much individual uh, perspective that comes with that and students bring, children bring their own experiences and background. So, um, and just because one student has this visual impairment doesn't mean it's the same for every student with that visual impairment. Um, Okay, so the other thing I want to say is um, it'd be great if you worked in pairs if you can. If not, this way. That's fine too. But I'm gonna walk so around. The first station the is going to be the pouring station. station. And then let's get started. And uh, Dan is here. If you have any trouble or if you spill, it's okay because I put down a plastic cloth, but you're all good. And there's paper towels there. So just experiment with pouring. The next station is really fun. It's always the highlight for everybody. And that is the travel next station. So you're going to come over here and you're going to put on some gloves and you're going to grab a recipe and you're going to follow the recipe and make trail mix. And 
hopefully you have a good start in your next year. Uh, the next big thing is the reading station. Well, Sorry, I just don't, I turn the camera off. We're moving. <laughs> We're back. Oh, so this is Reading Station, and this is going to have lots of magnifiers to try out, reading stands, um, lighting, um, all kinds of cool things. So just try it all out, see what works for you. And this is the, the writing and puzzle station. So you'll have some puzzles to put together, some keys to try to find the right fit in a lock. Um, so there's some things to do with cutting. So you'll try that. You'll try some puzzles and see if those are, you know, how those work for you. We generally don't like kids with visual impairments to do word searches. It's really not the best use of their time or their, their energy for their eyes. Um, and then you'll also do some writing with some bold options. Uh, and the final station, and this is going to do this in pairs, is um, if you're going to go on a little scavenger hunt, and you're gonna take turns. Uh, there are two things to find on each piece of paper and you can take turns. One can find the first thing, the next person can find the second thing and um, hopefully you won't get lost. If you get lost, you can get lost. <laughs> but um, so those are the five stations. Uh, we like to have about, um, I don't know, four, People, we can divide up into the, di the different stations so everybody doesn't run to the trail mix station. Um, <laughs> but yeah, try them all out. If you see an open space that is shaped, then go ahead and move on over there. But just float through them and try stuff out. And I'll be here to answer questions. And um, we have staff members at some different tables to help also. The goggles are on the far table underneath that sconce. And I'll be over there to start just to help you find goggles that you're looking for. If you're looking for a specific um, visual impairment or um, acuity level. So, all right, let's get started. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Do you want me to take your microphone?